on this niche, make it successful. If you're going to do that, then understand that for a niche market, you may not need to raise a lot of capital. And if you can build your business with a small amount of capital, make it profitable, and then if you really, if you think you can scale it, and you need money to scale it, then go do it. Otherwise, don't bother, because it, it, you know, nine out of 10 is not going to work. And if you've got investors, pay them out of the profits. I think investors would be happy to take dividends, those angel investors, right? Everybody gets caught up in that, oh, I got to do my VC round, I got to do my VC round. You have no idea what hell it is to take VC money if you don't make it, right? Now, I took VC money because I was going after this bigger TAM. Now, if I had, so if I had to start again, I, I would have looked at the big TAM, but I don't think I would have been able to raise the money. So honestly, I wouldn't do anything different other than just have the awareness that, um, that it wasn't necessary for me to take uh, VC, money, VC money. As a matter of fact, uh, the guy I worked for in Seattle, I called him up. He's still I good friends with him. He said that you're doing a disservice to your shareholders by taking this seven and a half million bucks. He was dead on right. Um, I should have just walked away from it because I didn't need them. And I should have just stuck with my business, you know, and I probably would have been bought out within 12 months. At a nice valuation, everybody would have walked away happy. And you are profitable at cash flow positive then? Yeah. I had half a million in my bank account. For a three-year-old company to have that cash position, which is the money I took in investment, I still had in my bank. So one of the companies I invested in early on this year is going through a partial exit. They've done exactly the same thing, which is they uh, they raised 1.4 million. The balance sheet still has 1.4 million. It's a SaaS product. They just did a deal with a um, private equity firm and they're buying out the current shareholders, half of their shares, at 2x return. So at least they get some return. Exactly. So if I had taken the VC, I should have just insisted, and I'm sure these guys, you know, they were dying to give the 10 million bucks. I'm sure I could have said, give me the two and a half so that I can, you know, secure my investors, and then who cares, right? So that's my only, so that was my other regrets. If I had to do it again, I would have insisted on that and not listened to my my CFO. So I think I will try and wrap this up with two or three learnings. And I think one of the most important uh, what I uh, learned from this whole conversation is uh, everybody wants to run after raising a lot of money, and and that's not really the holy grail. I mean, we we can always have uh, we can always bootstrap get great companies have companies which are profitable and they can have great exits without really having uh, VCs investing in these, uh, in these uh, companies. Uh, moreover, uh, I also see and we didn't really go into the details of how VCs could potentially be very troublesome, even while some of it came out of his uh, conversation, uh, that v VCs start pulling strings and, and uh, many of us who want to remain entrepreneurs uh, don't really want these strings. Uh, so then strings such as when are you going to sell out? Uh, so those things keep bothering you and keep you away from your main focus of the products and markets and customers that you're really looking for. Uh, so I think this is a unique uh, story according to what I uh, hear. Uh, we have heard variety of stories in the last couple of years, but this is a unique story and a lot to learn from. Uh, I thank uh, Nitin for sparing this time uh, with all of us. And uh, uh, I would request the audience if there are any questions. In fact, uh, we were also open for questions during this conversation, but I should have said that uh, even before that. Please. Hi, Nathan. Thanks for your inspiration. Uh, how did you think about scale back then? And how do you think about scale now? I mean, having gone through the 14-year journey. The way, the way I thought about uh, scale then was, you know, the market was very nascent then. There was not much EHR and we were one of the first companies to come in. So we had to really sell, educate the market, right? So scaling meant hiring a sales team, going to 15 to 20 trade shows, spending a lot of money advertising. Um, that's how we scale. 
Does that answer your question? Uh, How has the perception of scaling changed over the years? Having oh, the journey uh, that you have gone through. Like, you know, I'm trying to understand why, in what context are you asking me uh, the question? Because scaling is absolutely important, right? So scaling to me was, I was doubling my business every year. So that was my perception of scaling then, because we were first mover early in the market. That changed once we got sidetracked, right? And the, by, that, by that time, the market started to get saturated. So when you first launch a company and you have a new product, a new idea, scale can be 2x every year. But then once you hit sort of a maturity level, then if you're doing 15 to 20%, that's pretty good scale. You see what I'm saying? And the, the most important thing to me today is not as much about new customer acquisition as it is about keeping my current customers and delving deep into my customer in terms of generating revenue. As a matter of fact, our scaling plans today are not to acquire new customers, but actually increase our revenue 25, 30% or even more by just selling more stuff to our customers because they're really, really loyal uh, and they don't want to change, right? And they trust us. So we, have a, so we actually are a channel for third party companies from where we suck revenue out where we, um, you know, because they're so sticky. So we say, buy this, they buy it. So that's where the scale comes from. It's just revenue from within your customer base. So you talked about tranching, you know, and uh, thinking back today, you probably have not done that tranching the way the first funding happened. You had a CFO with you on the team. Right? Yeah. So was he part of the discussion and restructuring and was all the of thing is even him? he was the board on the tranching. He didn't we, we did not catch this tranching till we were close to signing the deal. And then they said, Oh we'll tranche. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. No, he even he missed the board. And you know, after six months I had to let him go too. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. He was great, great mentor. But even he lost sense of reality in that process. So, you know. But is that that standard practice? I don't know. Tranching money? No. Talk about it or no. If I if I raise money today, if I'm a, uh, uh, I mean, we did a deal with the VCC deal. All the money came in up front. There's no tranching. It was very weird uh, for that to happen. Uh, another another question. Yeah. You mentioned early on you were doing consulting to support your main business yeah. and your passion. Right. So how are you managing that early on? Well, and so this is to run right. Ships? So what I did was, so you know, at that at that level, we're so early. If you build the, so very important to have a good startup team, right? So I hired one of my good friends, who was a really good engineer and mentor. Mentor was doing lots of layoffs, so great talent pool to go pull in. So I hired him. Then there was an intern who was, so this other company that I consulted with. They had hired this kid from University of Portland, a really smart guy. He was sitting across from me. All day long, he was on uh, on the web, <laughs> you know, chatting on IRC. He had nothing to do. So I said, hey, Andy, I got some really good stuff. You want to work, work for me as an intern? He said, sure. So he, while he was going to school, he came to work for me. Then he brought another intern. So I used lots of interns to, you know, get this going, right? So you have to be creative. And most, most startups will do that. So it's very typical. But I had a good, this, this guy, Trevor, uh, Trevin, was really good, he was good with customers because we worked together, so we were, you know, it was sort of like, he was almost like a co-founder. So I could go on trips while they were working on the product, and while I was going on trips, I also would go in and install the software and train my customers. So I did all of it. I did sales and I did support. training and support. So I got to know the product really well and the market really well. So it worked out. So Nitin, uh, healthcare IT is a space that is talked about quite a lot. Can you throw your perspective on you know where it is today, where do you think it's headed internationally and, and in the right. US? Right. You know, I, I must say I talked to two guys here and I'm really very impressed that you know 